Years after the end of the Second World War, a fascinating photograph was uncovered by the researcher Richard Chapman. Then working as the editorial coordinator for Flugzeug Classic, he discovered this amazing image taken from inside the wartime Berlin Aviation Museum. Sitting among the other exhibits is clearly an RAF hurricane. Further examination and research showed that the aircraft in this mysterious photograph was Hurricane Mark 1 W9147. This particular aircraft had been operated by number 55 OTU until the 18th of September 1941, when it had disappeared over the North Sea on fire. But it was clearly W9147 in the photograph, practically undamaged except for its three-bladed propeller, now just wooden stubs, and its undercarriage doors slightly battered. But just how had the Germans recovered it from the bottom of the sea? W9147 was not being flown operationally, and even if it had been, no hurricane had the range to reach Berlin. It just didn't make sense. As researchers dug deeper, a very sinister story was retold, one of treachery, death and cold-blooded opportunism. And it all centred around the Czech pilot at W9147's control that day in September 1941, Augustine Preuchil. When you think of Czechs in the RAF, no doubt your mind turns to men like Joseph Frantisek, or the brave men of the many Czech fighter and bomber squadrons. Mention Czech cunning, and your mind might turn to Joseph Gabček and Jan Kubisch, who carried out Operation Anthropoid, the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich. But as with every nation, Czechoslovakia had its fair share of traitors and collaborators. Indeed, the Slovak Republic even sided with Germany after its secession. Nevertheless, this pilot story is perhaps one of the most surprising betrayals. Augustin Preuchil came from the quiet hamlet of Chepstin, 20 or so kilometres south of the Czechoslovakian capital. Known to his loved ones as Gusta, he came into the world on the 3rd of July 1914. Little did anyone suspect how his life would end. However, before too long, many in his rural community would peg Preuchil as a shady character. The mysterious death of local girl Marushka Yerushkova, who had once shunned the advances of young Preuchil, has ever been associated with him. His guilt has never been confirmed. Before the ominous clouds of World War II gathered, little Gusta had already earned his wings in the Czechoslovakian Air Force. His apparent expertise culminated in an instructor role in the 6th Observer Flight, a part of Air Regiment No. 1 named in honour of the statesman T.G. Masaryk. As the 1930s progressed, however, the fate of his homeland was sealed as Hitler cast his covetous eye on Czechoslovakia. 1938 witnessed the annexation of this Sudetenland, where many ethnic Germans resided. The event threw Europe into crisis. Important choices were being made across the continent. Britain's Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, embarked on a diplomatic mission to Munich in late September. He returned clutching a document signed by Hitler, Mussolini, Deladier and himself, proclaiming peace in our time. A sigh of relief swept over those yearning to avoid the horrors of another world war, but it was met with scepticism by the discerning few. Hitler's ink had barely dried before he trampled his commitment, seizing Bohemia and Moravia in March 1939. Amidst the turmoil, Preuchil's actions spoke louder than words. With his homeland under the grip of Nazi tyranny, he saw opportunity in the Luftwaffe. However, his application was met with rejection as he lacked the important status of a German national. Undeterred, he considered a daring escape to Brazil to realise his dream of becoming an airline pilot. But exiting the newly established protectorate was a punishable offence. This time, his attempted escape ended with his arrest. Then, in the summer of 1939, Preuchil's destiny took an unexpected twist. The Gestapo came knocking on his door with an offer he couldn't refuse. A branch of the secret police stationed in Prague under the watchful eye of Commissar Oskar Fleischer had a mission for him. He was to escape to Poland and spy on the Czech Air Force personnel who had found refuge in that country. It can only be assumed that darling Gusta jumped at the opportunity to work for his new overlords. Though not as a dedicated Nazi, but rather for the advantages such a role would give him. 
Now a freshly minted spy, the Czech turncoat embarked on the journey that would see him crossing the Polish border under a hail of gunfire and German shouts, ingredients that lent authenticity to his audacious escape. His destination? Krakow. From there, he was redirected to Mail Bronowitza, a nearby camp housing Czech personnel. So far, so good. But Poland was wary of accepting Czechs into its air force, fearing it might provide the Germans with a pretext for invasion. Thus, those who landed on Polish soil were quickly dispatched to France. The route taken was usually by ship from the bustling port of Danzig to the harbour at Le Havre. It has never been officially confirmed, but logic says that Preutschil joined those loyal Czechs boarding ships at Danzig, hoping to win back independence for their country. Upon their arrival in France, Czech refugees found a less than warm welcome compared to the Polish counterparts. France had a long-standing alliance with Poland dating back to 1921, which made Poles more readily accepted. True, a treaty of mutual assistance with Czechoslovakia dating from 1925 did remain on the books. However, with Germany's grip tightening on Czechoslovakia, harbouring refugees from its armed services could have sparked an international incident. Even as late as the summer of 1939, the Troisième République was hopeful to avoid a third war with the German state. Happily, a diplomatic solution emerged. Czechs faced a choice, enlist in the Foreign Legion or return to their homeland. Many opted for the former, setting course for Marseille. No doubt to their annoyance, many found themselves under the tutelage of harsh German NCOs of the Legion, a bitter irony that underscored the complexity of their circumstances. Following rigorous training, most were dispatched to Sidi Bel Abyss in Algeria, where they endured arduous lives as part of a diverse garrison made up of refugees from various nations. It remains unclear how exactly Preuchil journeyed through this convoluted system in France. What is certain, however, is that he did not serve in the Army de l'Air before the outbreak of World War II. When war clouds loomed large over Europe, France's stance towards the Czechs underwent a rapid transformation. Those in France or Algeria were now granted the opportunity to volunteer for military service. Preuchil seized this chance and joined Lamy de l'Air, embarking on a training course for fighter pilots at course number 6 of the Centre d'Instruction de Chasse, based approximately 45 miles southwest of the French capital. Official records for this period are hard to come by, as the precise details of Preuchil's flying activities during this period are unknown, the aircraft at his disposal offer a glimpse into his training. These included the sleek Block MB151, Agile Fiat CR42, sourced from Belgium, Morin Saunier MS406 and the nimble Dewatton D500. For several months he honed his skills in these aircraft, but it seemed his mind was elsewhere. Sergeant Rudolf Zimmer, one of his instructors, recalled that Preuchil displayed a lacklustre performance with a penchant for card games and self-amusement outweighing his dedication to improving his aviation knowledge and skills. It was a description that eerily aligned with his clandestine allegiance to the enemy. Surely more tantalising gossip was shared around the card tables than over in the cockpit. As it was for Preuchil, his time probably was better spent gathering intelligence than on training in French aircraft. The war in France saw only a handful of Czech aircrew engaged in operational flights. It appears that approximately 1,000 Czechs had arrived in France by May 1940, but a mere 123 actively took to the skies after successfully joining squadrons. Preuchil did not find himself among those daring aviators. As the clouds of defeat gathered over France and the nation eventually succumbed to the relentless Nazi advance, many Czechs managed miraculous escapes to the United Kingdom. They embarked from various ports spanning from Cherbourg in the north to Bordeaux in the southwest and Marseille in the south. In the shadows, Preuchil made his own way to the UK, likely setting sail from one of these French ports. It appears that he was still proving of some use to his Gestapo puppet masters and remained with his more loyal compatriots. All Czech airmen who found their way to Britain, be they flying or ground personnel, were ushered into the fold of the RAF VR. They embarked on a transformative journey, one that saw them adapting to new roles and procedures, often beginning with elementary English lessons. Augustin Preuchil, an enigmatic figure in this unfolding drama, was no exception. He became Sergeant Number 787-344. 
Determining Preuccio's exact steps in the RAF is tricky. Despite the RAF's meticulous personal record keeping from the Second World War, much of it remains locked away. Preuccio's personal records won't be fully open to the public until at least 2030. However, the echoes of Preuccio's journey can still be traced through the excellent records kept with the Czech Republic and the annals of the RF squadrons and units, nestled away in the public records office at Kew. Nevertheless, not all records survived the conflict. Despite being in the UK for several months already, Preuccio doesn't appear in the records again until September 1940, attached to 43 Squadron at RAF Usworth in Durham. On September 19, 1940, this squadron had transitioned into a training role, and Preuccio's name appears frequently over the ensuing two months. His training missions unfolded in the cockpit of Hurricane Ones, where he honed his skills in formation flying, aerobatics, combat manoeuvres and high altitude sorties. Alongside him were numerous trainees bearing Czech and Polish names, all of which start to disappear from 43 Squadron records by December 1940. Preuccio's name next shows up on the books for an operational squadron, number 605, stationed in Sussex. The squadron was then flying the Hurricane 1 and on the cusp of transitioning to the slightly improved Hurricane 2A. Equipped with the Rolls-Royce Merlin 20 two-stage supercharged engine, this new Hurricane variant promised speeds nearly 20 miles per hour faster than its predecessor. Yet Preuccio's name quickly becomes notably absent in the squadron's records, suggesting an abrupt and unspoken departure. We can only conclude that Preuccio was not up to snuff as a fighter pilot and quickly reassigned. But was that all by design? His journey continued with a relocation to number 10 maintenance unit at RAF Hullervington in Wiltshire. Here, a diverse array of aircraft, including Hurricanes, underwent servicing and rigorous testing. A subsequent move found him at number 33 MU, stationed at RF Linham, also in Wiltshire, followed by a posting to number 18 MU at RF Dumfries in Dumfriesshire. He arrived in Scotland on March 6, 1941, designated for ferry duties. He remained with number 11 ferry flight until July 1st, 1941, and was then posted to RF Kemble in Gloucestershire, which was the home of number 5 MU. For a spy like Preuchil, such a series of postings must have enabled him to gather a wide variety of information for his Gestapo handlers. How useful it proved to be is anybody's guess. Whether at the bidding of his overlords or under his own initiative, Preuccio would seriously up the ante during his next and final RF posting. By September 1941, Preuccio was again stationed at RF Usworth, this time as a junior instructor for 55 OTU. Nevertheless, he was not to remain in this role for long. It is almost certain that Preuccio was in close contact with another German spy based in the UK, who gave him orders and passed on his information to Berlin. Research carried out by both Richard Chapman and Roy Nesbitt suggested that Berlin was eagerly seeking information on Britain's latest fighter developments. It has been said that Preuccio was encouraged to steal a Hurricane Mark II and fly it back to his German masters, something that would have been much easier if he had remained with 605 Squadron. Nevertheless, no official records have emerged about this, and as the results played out, it's clear that Preuccio was unable to do this. In fact, his actions cost Germany one of the few operational spies they possessed on English shores. Many other agents had been captured or turned by British intelligence. Preuccio was lucky to escape with his life, but perhaps that was a gamble worth taking. In September 1941, number 55 operational training unit was engaged in honing the skills of Czech and Polish fighter pilots. At that time, the main training aircraft was the Hawker Hurricane. As can be expected in a training unit, danger was a daily companion. The operational record book is punctuated by almost daily accidents. While most were relatively minor, some cast a darker shadow with fatal consequences. The exact date of Preuccio's arrival remains elusive, but his name etched itself into the archives on July 27th, 1941. It was a day marred by an unfortunate incident when he mishandled the fuel system of Hurricane V7608, resulting in a forced landing near Horton Le Spring. Just two weeks later, Sergeant Stamp was killed in the same aircraft. Preuccio was lucky that day and emerged unscathed, yet his lapse in care did not go unnoticed. He would have been severely chewed out for such a blunder. 
It has been suggested that all this incompetence was part of the spy's plan to avoid combat and practice his eventual bid for freedom. His former flight commander from Chartres, Flight Lieutenant Frantisek Berda, offered a less than flattering characterization of Preutschel's life in England, painting a picture of a man known for leading a sloppy life forever entangled in financial woes. It would not be too far-fetched to imagine that by this point in his career as a spy, Preutschel was seriously questioning his choices. Germany was clearly winning the war, and here he was risking his neck while pretending to fight for the losing side. What if he got posted to an operational squadron? What if he was forced into combat? Surely being back in Prague and working as a friend of the Germans would have been the smarter choice. I'm certain that by September 1941, Preutscher was seriously planning his next escape. This time, it would be for real. Preutscher's final flight, an apparent fateful sortie, transpired on September the 18th, 1941, as he took to the skies in Hurricane W9147. This particular aircraft had been on strength of RAF Usworth since the days when 43 Squadron was in the throes of training at the station. Notably, it seemed to have served as the personal aircraft of the chief flying instructor at the time, squadron leader John Ellis, a distinguished Battle of Britain veteran adorned with the DFC. However, that day, Preutscher was actually operating from one of the number 5502U satellite airfields at RAF Alstom near Newcastle upon Tyne. According to the meticulous records inscribed on the Air Ministry form number 1180 accident record car, Preutschel had logged an impressive 173 hours in the RAF, with a staggering 163 hours spent flying solo. Despite the opinions of him among his peers, Preutschel was no novice pilot, it would seem. On this fateful day, he engaged in a dogfighting exercise, soaring over the stretch of sea between Sunderland and West Hartlepool accompanied by a Polish sergeant pilot. However, their flight took a harrowing turn when the Polish pilot lost sight of Preutschel's hurricane. The apparently less seasoned Polish pilot reported that flames were coming out of the radiator. This occurred just after 1700 hours local time. The grim observation of the hurricane engulfed in flames at the time led the powers that be to one obvious conclusion. Sergeant Preutschel had gone down with his aircraft and was missing believed killed. His name found a solemn place on a plaque commemorating the sacrifice of nearly 500 Czech airmen who laid down their lives for the cause of freedom between 1939 and 1945. However, it remained conspicuously absent from the rosters of RF war dead at the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and the ledges of the RF Church of St. Clement's Dane at Aldwych in London. As David Chapman had discovered, and the British government knew, Preutschel had faked the entire thing. So what had really happened to Augustin Preutschil and Hurricane W9147? Simply put, Preutschil had made a run for it. As the evening unfolded, the Czech spy would end up in a small Belgian village 11 miles from the Luxembourg border, an impressive 460 miles from where he took off. Based on the research of Roy Nesbitt, the trail was taken up again decades later. Through his contacts on the continent, it was determined that Preutschil never made landfall in the Netherlands. However, the aircraft had been sighted by a German flak unit stationed at Vlissingen in Belgium, nestled close to the Dutch border. The records chronicled an enigmatic entry, a mysterious aircraft approaching at 21.28 hours Central European time on that very same September night. It circled the area from 21.30 to 21.33 before veering inland. This timeline dovetailed reasonably well with the estimated 300-mile flight Preutschil would have undertaken to reach the region. Obviously, the Czech spy had mastered the Hurricane's fuel system and put it to good use for his escape. However, nowhere in the German archives does it state the sighting was a hurricane. But during nightfall, this is understandable. Preutschil's flight towards the continent raises a number of questions. Firstly, was this defection premeditated? Did he have any assistance from German high command? And why didn't the man simply land at the first available German-controlled airfield he found? Well, Preutschil seems to have been an opportunist by nature. There is strong circumstantial evidence that he was ordered to flee Britain. Rather than being a chance to steal a vital enemy aircraft, the Hurricane Mark I being old hat by this point, Preutschil was a valuable asset himself. 
Being in an extremely mediocre position as a spy in Britain, he was much more used as a Nazi stooge in his native land. Also, the fact that he was not intercepted during the arduous flights over the continent also suggests German help. But why did he choose to force land rather than putting his prize down on a German airfield? His arrival over Otto Belgium, according to researcher Philip Payne, may have had more sinister motives. I personally believe that the man landed in the area by mistake, and not by design. I actually know the area fairly well, having completed my pilot training at saint Hubert Airfield, not 10 kilometres from Otto. And had he flown a further 20 miles on his track, Preuchil would have reached Germany herself. There are also a dozen period airfields within a 50 kilometre radius of the Belgian village that could have provided a safer landing for Preuchil. Sadly, he did not spot any of them. The other question that has been raised, did Preuchil make a direct flight or land to refuel? Could a Hurricane Mark I have made the 460 or so miles from RF Alstom to Autol, Belgium? At a pinch, yes, but it would take excellent fuel management to achieve it. As we know, Preuchil had already pranged a Hurricane due to his apparent mismanagement of its fuel. A standard Hurricane Mark I had a maximum effective fuel capacity of 94 gallons. The pilot's notes state that the usual fuel load was nearer 75 gallons. As the aircraft Preuchil was flying was being used for combat practice, we can assume it was fully loaded. The pilot's notes also tell us that the ideal speed to achieve maximum range was 160 miles per hour indicated airspeed. This could be achieved at M ratio settings, the lowest being minus 4 boost at 2000 RPM, which achieved a fuel burn of 30 gallons per hour on paper. This would give Preuchil a total flight time of some 2.5 hours. Of course, this also included the 30 mile or so flight from RF Alstom to a point over the sea between Sunderland and Hartlepool. From the moment he lost his Polish trainee, we can assume he made a climb to an appropriate height to cross the North Sea. All of this reduced his fuel reserves and reduced his range. Purely based on maths, trying to fly 460 odd miles at 160 indicated airspeed in less than two and a half hours doesn't compute. He couldn't have done it. However, when you factor in the atmospheric conditions, a more realistic picture emerges. Due to the heavy weather that September evening, Preuchil undoubtedly didn't fly on the deck all the way to the continent. As soon as you add altitude to the flight, the aircraft's true airspeed increases. At 10,000 feet, in standard atmospheric conditions, his 160 indicated airspeed gives a true airspeed of 192 miles per hour. At 20,000 feet, it's 227 mph. Looking at period weather charts for September the 18th, 1941, we can see that indicated wind speeds read as 5 knots from the southeast around Newcastle, between 10 knots from the east off the Humber, and then 15 knots from the northeast around the English Channel. And also based on this data, Preuchil would have faced a stronger 25 knot easterly wind over Belgium. Using this to calculate the ground speeds during the flight, you'd expect a range between 182 mph and 217 mph at 10 and 20,000 feet respectively. Of course, wind is not a static component and it changes at different altitudes. Even with a slight tailwind, a direct flight seems plausible. But what about the timing of the two key sightings? So while I believe that a hurricane could have made the flight given the suggested wind conditions of the day, it may have involved a stop to refuel. The Polish trainee flying with Preuchil reported that he went down after 1700 hours. But is that 501 or 530 or what? If we assume that the report of an unidentified aircraft over Vlissingham at 2128 hours was our man, that would put him in the air for at least two hours, if not nearly three. This meant that he would have covered the direct 300 miles track from Sunderland to Vlissingham with a ground speed of 150 mph or so. That's with 150 miles left to reach his final touchdown at Otto in Wallonia. Of course, this is all assuming that Preuchil knew exactly where he was going. More likely, as the unidentified aircraft circled for several minutes, he was lost and probably didn't fly a direct course. As a former ferry pilot, it does seem likely, as researcher Phil Payne suggested, that Preuchil instead landed his hurricane in the UK before making the crossing to the continent. He would have known the form, 
and would have been able to achieve this without too much suspicion. After all, nobody at that stage was looking for him as an escaping spy. The exact nature of his flight for freedom will never be known, or why he ended up in Orto, Belgium. I'm not entirely convinced by the suggestion made by Phil Payne that he deliberately landed in the region at the orders of his Gestapo overlords. I would be more convinced that as an average pilot, Preuccio was lucky to get as far as he did. What he did next speaks more of desperation than meticulous planning. The trace of Preuccio is then taken up by Jean-Louis Robat. His research led to the memories of Didier Campion. In September 1941, the 14-year-old Belgian found himself unwittingly drawn into the web of wartime intrigue. Didier was on holiday in the Ardennes region near Otto, accompanied by his father, when fate intervened. A breathless farm worker approached them urgently, in need of someone who spoke English. The reason? A British aircraft had touched down nearby, and linguistic assistance was urgently required. Undeterred by the looming curfew, Didier dashed to the scene, only to discover that the pilot had been whisked away, leaving behind an aircraft that bore the unmistakable insignia of the Royal Air Force. But where had the pilot gone? Upon Preuccio's dramatic landing at Otto, he was immediately helped by other local Belgians. These patriots believed him to be an authentic Allied airman in need of help. The Czech was taken away by Monsieur Dorin, Monsieur and Madame Chalier, and given shelter for the night. However, Preuccio repaid that act of bravery with treachery. Giving his host the slip the next morning, he returned at the head of a German patrol. Armand Durin and Leon Chalier paid the ultimate price, falling victim to German bullets. Chalier's wife and a fellow Belgian named Antoine were condemned to prison sentences for their role in helping Preuchil. At this juncture, Gusta, the renegade, must have harboured a sense of triumph. He had arrived with an aircraft that remained nearly unscathed, thereby winning the approval of his clandestine masters. However, it has to be stated that by 1941, handing the Germans a Hurricane Mark I was all but useless. Preuccio was clearly out to save his own skin, and therefore handing over a group of Belgian malcontents must have been the surest way to prove his loyalty. And it was important to be in with the Nazis right around then. His adopted master, Germany, seemed to be riding the crest of victory. Despite a momentary impasse with Britain, the German juggernaut, propelled by its audacious invasion of Russia, had achieved remarkable territorial conquests, with Moscow seemingly within reach. The United States, for the time being, maintained its status of neutrality, further bolstering the Third Reich's prospects. In recognition of his services, Preuccio was dispatched to Prague, where a handsome reward of 10,000 Reichmarks awaited him, a substantial sum in those days certainly worth 30 pieces of silver, and then some. His new role immersed him in the corridors of Gestapo's Department N, based in the capital. Within this shadowy realm, Preuccio's task remained largely administrative, involving the meticulous cataloguing and record-keeping of individuals of his own nationality who were actively opposing the Third Reich. Occasionally, he was called upon to assist in the interrogation of Czech airmen held within the confines of prisoner of war camps. One striking instance of the information Preuccio divulged emerges from the records of the Luftwaffe interrogation centre nestled in Oberursel near Frankfurt. There, Flight Lieutenant Franciszek Sigos of 311 Squadron found himself, following the harrowing downing of his Vickers Wellington back on the night of January 6th and 7th, 1941. Confronted with a deceptive Red Cross form to fill in by a German Gefreiter, Sigos, masking his fluency in Czech, responded in French, feigning ignorance of his mother tongue. Unfazed, the German promptly disclosed in Czech Sigos' station as RF East Retham, his squadron as 311, and even divulged the name of his commanding officer, Toman. Every detail had been provided to the Germans by Preicho. For other Czech prisoners serving with the Royal Air Force, their path inevitably led them to the ominous Gestapo interrogation centre at Pretzka Palace. This was a shadowy building near the iconic Wenceslas Square in Prague. This was often their first stop before their eventual transfer to prison of war camps. Among the incarcerated was Flight Sergeant Willem Bufka, a pilot and sole survivor of a 311 Squadron Wellington down during a daring raid on Bremen in the early hours of June the 23rd, 1941. 
Bufka's arrival at the hands of the Gestapo ushered in an unsettling reunion, orchestrated by none other than Preucho himself. Bufka, perhaps genuinely, stated he had no memory of Augustin Preucho. He was given a grim reminder of their shared history in Poland, France and England before Preucho, driven by his loyalty to the Commissar, shared every morsel of knowledge with his superior. The ordeal left Bufka, like many others, grappling with a profound sense of anger. How could a fellow Czech have betrayed them so? Flight Lieutenant Franciszek Burda, another figure ensnared in this sinister web of espionage, experienced a similarly disconcerting encounter. Shot down in the 310 Squadron Spitfire on February the 27th, 1943, Burda found himself facing the immaculately attired Preuchil, now clothed as a civilian, during one of the relentless interrogations. Preuchil, offering a cigarette, attempted to open Burda up by invoking their shared service in the same flight as Schart, alongside comrades Dandera and Sticker. Such a damning piece of information put Burda and his family in peril. But soon, it would be the spy facing danger. As the war's end loomed ominously, Preuchil's role evolved, morphing into that of a stool pigeon at Theresiastat, an internment camp housing Czech civilians, as well as other camps detaining captured Czech partisans. The consequences of his actions weighed heavily on the resistance fighters, whose identities were betrayed, costing some their lives. Inevitably, Preuchil must have sensed the approaching reckoning, realising the catastrophic choice he had made by aligning himself with the wrong side. Astonishingly, he made no effort to escape the impending retribution. Was this remorse? Or just misplaced trust in his own ability to get away with it? On the 19th of May, 1945, as Czechoslovakia embarked on a fleeting bout of independence before the iron grip of communists descended in February 1948, Preuchil was apprehended, sealing the dark chapter of his nefarious career. During his ignominious tenure, Preuchil played the role of a minor, yet thoroughly malevolent spy and collaborator. One who relentlessly turned against his own compatriots and former comrades in exchange for financial rewards and other incentives. His actions can only be described as contemptible, reflecting a betrayal that cut to the core of trust and loyalty. Whereas the story was forgotten for decades following the peace, Preuchil's actions had not gone unnoticed by the Allies. A damning wartime report by the British Air Ministry chronicled Preuchil's treachery against the Belgian farmers. This was obviously also known in Prague. It has been said of Preuchil that he remained devious to the very end. Attempting to cheat the hangman's noose, he made the bold claim of being wed to a British subject, Muriel Graham Kirby. This is a fairly conspicuous British name, however the original research carried out by Roy Nesbitt stated that there were no records of such a marriage. At the time, it seemed this was an attempt to lay claim to British citizenship, a futile endeavour that ultimately yielded no reprieve. However, just a couple of decades after this story first re-emerged in the public memory, I can confirm that Augustin Preuchil did indeed marry a mural Graham Kirby in Sunderland in July 1941. Was he intentionally denied his status as a British citizen by marriage? Was the marriage an attempt on his part to gain leniency in the future? The events following September 18th, 1941 must have been incredibly challenging for Muriel. Initially, she learned that her husband's aircraft was believed to have gone down in the North Sea, and he was listed as missing. Subsequently, British security services likely conducted visits involving aggressive questioning and searches to ascertain what she knew about Preichel's activities. It must have been a real shock for her to discover that he had defected and was still alive. Despite his trial for treason in Prague in 1947, Muriel never believed that he was a traitor and consistently defended his reputation for the rest of her life. She, like so many, had been well and truly deceived by this Czech spy. The culmination of Preuchil's sordid journey was his hanging on April the 14th, 1947, marking the sombre conclusion of a life entrenched in deception and betrayal. If you've enjoyed this video, please do give it a like to help it spread to more people. And if you like this secret side of the Second World War, why not check out the video on screen right now? It's a good one.